uh, this past few days. It has been a turmoil and uh, whatever we hear and see uh, remind us that nothing is uh, lasting except the kingdom of God. Uh, you know, big nations, uh, we never felt they are so fragile, uh, so uh, you know, exposed to things like fear and hysteria that happens around the world. So it, it reminds us that it is a, it's a good to remember what we really, uh, Jesus taught us, that uh, he gave us his peace and great peace he has left with us. So this morning we're going to uh, talk about uh, the title, The King and the Priestly Role, uh, Hebrews 4 to 5. We're, we're going to see a few verses from Hebrews 4 and also uh, 5. Uh, if you really read about the book of Hebrews, it's amazing because it's one of uh, very deep theological books in, we find in the Bible, especially about the nature of Christ, the nature of the new covenant, the nature, nature of God's new promise. And uh, nobody uh, really f knows for sure who wrote that book. And scholars cannot agree who wrote it. But a uh, few things you want to know about this person who wrote it is that he's a very skilled person. That um, he is very fluent in Greek. And he reads the Greek Bible. And uh, he's very familiar with the Old Testament. And in you, everything he writes, you know, he kind of draws a parallel between what the Lord has been doing in the Old Testament and what is happening in the New Testament. And if you really think about the time, most scholars agree that it was before the fall of uh, Jerusalem. It's because uh, he never mentioned the fall of the, the tabernacle and uh, the temple. Uh, he speaks as if still the, 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 the religious ceremony continues. So it, it might be probably before uh, 70, 80. And um, the audience... Also, we're not explicitly told who these people are, but we can understand they are Jewish because uh, the matter he was dealing is not a Gentile believers. It is more about the covenant, the sacrifice, the high priest, the Aaron and Moses and angels. Also, these are the things that the writer talks about. So you can guess that these people are Jewish uh, believers and... Um, and then they have gone through a lot of persecution, a lot of pain. Uh, if, if you go to chapter uh, 10, verse 32 and up to 34, it tells you that they have gone through a lot of persecution. They have lost a lot. So, and then also indicates that they are going another persecution. For some of us, persecution is an all-time thing. It is of the past. Uh, nowadays, there is no persecution. But I, I just want you to, I want, I want you to know that persecution is real. Persecution is real in many parts of the world uh, and very close to our neighbors, including to some part of our country. Uh, Christians have been suffering because they're believers. I was in Kenya last week and I had an opportunity to speak in an Eritrean church. And on Tuesday evening, they invited us for a dinner. So we went to this beautiful place and they prepared a beautiful meal. And I don't know how the conversation turned into the persecution, but these people started to share their stories. And my friend and I were like shocked because they were laughing, they're making jokes, but they are not matters of really making jokes. The pastor was telling us that one day he was in the ceremony of a wedding and the secret police broke in to round and rounded everyone and then he knew that it was so dangerous but if everybody is caught they will end up in jail so he has to sacrifice himself he went ran and then he started to confront the people who came to arrest him they were they were arguing with him and then he's giving signals for people to flee especially the video man he said and I ask him why because he said if they have that video, they will know every member of the church in that area. So I wanted him to escape, and he did. 
That pastor was put to prison for one year and three months for doing that. Another lady, the, the host, our host, it's amazing. She was sharing, and then she was laughing about it. And then she, they beat her so much. They beat her in the head that when she walks up, she doesn't remember who she is. She doesn't remember where she is, what she's there for. And then slowly her memory starts to come back. And she found this young lady next to her. She was helping her. She's a young mother. And she told her that if they ask me, I will tell them anything they want to know. And I said, why? Why do you do that? Why do you betray the church? She said that their, my husband just died a few, few, few years ago because of his faith. I have little kids at home. Nobody is caring for them. And I'm in prison. I want to go to back to my kids. So I'll tell them everything, everything. So on her time of being tortured came, she just told them who the pastor was, where the Bibles are, where they meet, and everything. And they come, this investigator come laughing to this lady and said, we know everything. You, we know who you are, what your role in the church is. But she has to deny everything. Because if I agree with that, they are going to go and round it up people. This has been going on for the past 20 years. Our now neighbor. Hundreds and thousands of believers are in prison. The leaders of the church for the past 20 years, they are in prison. So what I'm trying to tell you is persecution is not something that happened 2,000 years ago. It's happening today. In most parts of the, the world, people are being persecuted. And in those hard times, they need to have something to hold on. They need, there must be something that keeps them going. And then the, Hebrew, the, the message, the whole book of the Hebrew is trying to tell them that, they, hey, brothers and sisters, we have a great hope to hang on. We shouldn't just give up. And then that's exhortation. In fact, he himself, the writer says in Hebrew chapter 13, 22, he says, Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation. For in fact, I have written to you quite briefly. He says that I'm trying to write this to encourage you. Yes, you are passing through a hard time, but the reason to be steadfast and firm. If you see the pattern of the book, is, there's a always comparison. He says uh, in Hebrew 2 and 2, he, he, he says, uh, he, compares, he, he compares the situation of the blood, the message that was spoken by the angels. If that is very important and people are judged not obeying that, how much more does the salvation that comes through Jesus? In fact, he was comparing from verse 1. He tells you chapter 1, verse 1, it says that God has been speaking to us in many ways. To our forefathers, he made in many ways, in various ways, through prophet. But this in last days, God sent his only begotten son to speak to us. In other words, God is a, speak, a speaking God. Today, this morning, he speaks to us through his word and through his spirit. God always speaks. But he compares that the messenger that was sent before Jesus were very powerful. If we obey to their message, there is punishment. Imagine if that is the reason how much more does the message of Jesus, if we disobey, we have punishment. He also compares about the blood of goats and bulls in Hebrew 9.13. He says, if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean, how much more then will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleans our consciousness from acts that leads to days so that we may serve the living God. He says that the blood in the Old Testament were cleaning people outwardly. But imagine the precious blood of Jesus Christ who knew no sin. He can clean our mind, spirit, and body. If we reject this, we miss a lot of things. In Hebrew 10, 28, he still compares, if anyone who, who rejects the law of Moses die without mercy and the testimony of two or three witnesses, 
How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trumped the Son of God underfoot? Who has treated as an unholy things the blood of the covenant that sanctified them and who has insulted the spirit of grace? And he continues in verse 12, uh, verse chapter 12, 25, the same thing. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on the earth, how much less will we if we turn away for him who warns us from heaven? The prophet that was serving them, if they turn against them and then there's a punishment, imagine God sent from heaven his son. So he is telling them, yes, you're going under hard time, but Jesus is real. His love is real. His sacrifice is real. You should not think this is something to give away. And it's imagine, he, he, he compares, if you go through the book, he compares Jesus with the angels, Jesus with Moses, Jesus with Aaron. He compares the first covenant and the second covenant. He, he, he tells them a lot of things. But when we come to our verse from Hebrew chapter 4, verses 14, 14, he starts to give them reason why they should be strong and firm. He says, because, chapter 4, 14, he says, because we have a great high priest who has ascended in heaven, into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. You must be strong because you're not alone. There is a high priest in heaven. He also defines high priest in chapter 4. 5, 1, it says, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matter of related to God. The high priest's job is to bring us closer to God and then to give, offer gifts and sacrifices. So Jesus is doing that role. He every day presenting his people, you and me, before his Father. And then he shows the Lord, the Father, the blood that he shed because of us. What is sacrifice? The Miriam Webster Dictionary defines sacrifice as uh, destruction or surrender of something for the sake of something else. The Bible is full of sacrifice. If you go back in history, the Bible tells us in Genesis that God created man and, and woman in his image. They created them to represent him. His goodness, his mercy was upon their life. But man sinned. The Bible tells us man sinned. And then immediately what happened was when we sin, we can't stand in the presence of God. They hid themselves. It's amazing. You know, sin destroys the knowledge we have about God. Because God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. That he knows everything. He can be in every place at the same time. And he's powerful. You can't hide from God. But sin distorts the image of God. And when people sin, they try to hide themselves from God. So God came searching for man. It's amazing. It's not man who search God for God. It is God who search man. It's amazing today. God is doing the same thing. The church is here to look for people through the name of Jesus and share the goodness of God. God is still in the mission of searching people and calling them to his house. But by the time he called out the name of Adam, Adam came. And this is what happened. When they sin, they realize they are naked. They can't stand before God. And what happened was the husband and wife, I don't know who came up with this idea, but they tried to cover themselves. They put some clothes out of a fig tree. And they, they, they want to restore the damage that was done through sin. And when God looked at them, they have attempted to cover their nakedness. But, you know, whatever attempt we, have, we, we do, whatever we think we do, we can't cover the, our nakedness. It's only God who can cover us. Somebody said religion is an attempt to cover our sins by our good deeds. It is an effort that we do. If we become good enough, we, we work hard, we, we pray hard, we give hard money to people, maybe those good deeds will cover our nakedness. 
And God may be accept us. But that's impossible. God looked at that. And then he made a clothes out of a skin. The Bible is silent about that, where the skin comes. But we can just do an intelligent guess. Something else has been killed for them to be covered. The first days the husband and wife, Adam and Eve, so was not their days of your son, but it was the days of an innocent animal. Sacrifice started in that presence of God, the beginning. Every time they approach God, something has to be killed. God was reminding them that we cannot cover our own sin. Somebody has to die on our behalf. They taught their children, Cain and Abel, this way. They raised them this way. And then for the first time when they appeared before God, the Lord Abel knew that he should take a sacrifice. The only way to approach God is if you have a sacrifice. And then you, you go through the Old Testament. God turned this into a law. And every Israeli, if they have to approach God, they have to come with a lamb, a year old lamb, or a bull, one year old lamb, bull. And they have to sacrifice him. And the blood is sprinkled upon them. For the remission of sin. Imagine it's a, a year old lamb. So the process starts the day of atonement. You have to start from the first day. And then keep one year. To raise this lamb that will take away your sin. And you have to be very careful. Because if there is any blemish. It will not be acceptable by God. So it is a hard work that every man walks up in the morning. He looks, go to see the sheep and then check. Because he knows that this sheep will be sacrificed on his behalf. And then cleansing will come through that. So they will be very serious to do that. But after the fall of Israel to Babylon and they were scattered, the rule somehow changed a little bit. You don't have to raise your own lamb. What you have to do is you come with money, you come to the temple, and you buy a lamb for your sin. So the process of one year... It, it was shortened to just one day. So if you have money, you come to the temple. You have to go to the many money changers. They will, they will tell you the exchange rate of the day. So you change and you go and you buy a ship. And you take it to the priest. The priest will take it in. You don't know what happened. He comes with the blood and sprinkles you. And they recycle the ship and comes back again to be sold. They were so dissatisfied. The sacrifice... They know it's not cleansing them. And they were looking for a, a greater sacrifice that will cleanse them. What happened? When John the Baptist came, he came with a strange message. Nowhere in the scripture that you see that there is a remission of sin by the washing through of water. It is, you need blood for the forgiveness of sin. But this time John came and preached, hey, come be baptized and you will be cleansed. And Mark will tell us who came for that sermon. You, you will imagine the Galileans, okay, they are farmers, they, okay, they, they are not that educated. But he continues, people came from Galilee, Judea, and then Jerusalem. Oh, these are the people who live around the temples. And then not only the people in Jerusalem, but the priests also came to do what? To be baptized by water and to be cleansed. The priest shouldn't come because he knows that it's only through the blood that could be cleansed. But he, they know that it's not satisfactory. So they were looking for a sacrifice that satisfies God. So what happened? Jesus became not only our priest, but he became our sacrifice. And then that's what he tells them. Now we have a high priest who ascended to heaven. And then... He continues to say, verse 15 says, because he empathizes with our weakness, he understands us. This high priest is not like other high priests. Jesus became man so that everything that happened to man, that he will also experience. The writer, in fact, tells us he went, he was tempted through many challenges, but he has never sinned. So when we are struggling, when we feel like we are alone, we are lonely, Jesus understands he knows what loneliness means. He knows what pain means. So he is able to represent us. 
So he says, he's telling them, yes, I know you are struggling, but I want you to know you have a high priest who understands your situation. So be bold. And he continues to say, in verse 16, he says, we can approach God in confidence to receive mercy when we fall short and grace when we feel weak. He says, don't worry about your failure. Don't worry about your limitation. Just go to the presence of God. In the presence of God, there is mercy. Not only covers your sins, but also brings blessing. There is grace. When your strength ends, God's strength will start in your life. So don't go back. Just come back to the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, I think that is it. The hardest the situation is that we should be found in the presence of God. Most people will go away and they will not come to church when there is struggle. But I think that the right place to be when your life is going through a turmoil is in the presence of God. Because in there, there is mercy and grace. And he continues to say, this, this high priest is like Aaron. God is the one who chose him. He never chose himself. God has chosen him. This, uh, he, there's a lot of this theological discussion we can do. But just one thing to know is God picked him to be our high priest. And then in, verse, in chapter 5, 9 to 10, he says, Because in suffering he obeys God. When God put him through all those pains, he was so humble enough, he took everything upon him and was willing to die on the cross. Then he became the source of salvation. Everything that we need is in Jesus. And he's telling them, why backslide? Why go back? Because in Jesus, you have the salvation of your soul. Brothers and sisters, this message is not only relevant at that time, but it is also relevant to our time. Yes, maybe the, the nature of persecution and hardship differs from one generation to another generation, but every one of us are tempted in a daily basis. We have gone through, as a church, in a painful morning time. Most people ask questions, why? Why God allow these things to happen? And this is not only our question. Scripture tells us, Job asked that question, why do you let a righteous man suffer? David asked that question, why do you forgive the wicked? Uh, Asaph, Psalm 73, he says, God is good unto Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But as for me, I was about to slip away. Why? Because I have seen the prosperity of the evil. Those who should be punished are prospering. Those who should be in prosperity are going through hardship. Why? This is a question that we always ask, but we know. This is just the beginning of the story, but it's not the end. We have a brighter future that Jesus is coming, and he has prepared heaven for us. So every one of us need exhortation in different times of life. And I think, brothers and sisters, it's very important. It's very, very important that we should be together with the people of God. The first thing that you need exhortation is that you need to be among believers. Thank you, Brother Dereja. He just mentioned about the small group ministry. For the past 15 years, my main ministry was helping churches have small groups. It's not just to do one aspect of the church, but to be a church to each other, to encourage each other, to love each other. The church happens not only when we gather for two hours on Sunday, the church happens on a daily basis. You know, most of the time we think the church is outside. It's a building that we meet once a week out there. No, the church happens in your house. The altar in your house, if it is broken, if you don't meet God there, if you don't fellowship around the altar of God, then you can't recognize the God who are worshiping here. So he tells them in Hebrew chapter 10, do not give away your meetings. 
especially when the day comes nearer. Brothers and sisters, I think the fellowship of believers is a very important thing. If you don't have a church, find a good church and join. I'm not saying that just put your main name in the uh, members list. I'm not saying that. I'm saying find brothers and sisters that are worshiping and loving you and uh, walking with them. If you don't have a fellow, small group fellowship, I think it's very important to have it. Things are so fast. We are so much bombarded by a lot of information. We need a time to slow down and just listen from other brothers and sisters. Everything is in instant. It's in our fingertip. You can download podcasts. You can listen to Bible while you're driving, or you can do it, and then you, th- you feel spiritual, and then you neglect the gathering of brothers and sisters. But God has designed the church to be this way. A spiritual transformation not only happens in our closet, it happens also when we meet in a small group. So have a small group. The second thing we learn from Hebrew is any exhortation should be through the Word of God. I, I, I can't tell you how many times he quoted the scriptures from the Old Testament to show them, yes, what you believe is true. Brothers and sisters, we, we, we're looking, we put our ears to motivational speakers to this and that, and then there's just human wisdom, and there's no Word of God, but we can't get exhortation from people's wisdom. We need to come back to the Word of God. Exhortations should happen through the Word of God. There must be a time where you personally study the Word of God and meet with other people to learn and hear the Word of God. In hard times, the only thing that will hold you strong and firm is the Word of God that has been tested through its generation. So I think we need to give a special attention to the Word of God. And the third thing that the writer tells them is that they should fix their eyes on Jesus. Exhortation should focus on Jesus. In fact, in Hebrew 12, when he concluded the great sermon about men who trusted God, he says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the central of our faith. The song we sung earlier is an amazing song. Jesus at the center of everything all. Every spiritual activity, every preaching, every song, everything you do, if you if just take away Jesus from it, it will just become a religious exercise, a good thing. But Jesus at the center of everything, everything we think, everything we do, our marriage, our ministry, our work, our business, if we have Jesus at the center of it, then everything else will fall into a place. A few months ago, we went to a spiritual retreat. And the lady who shared with us is a potter. And she came with a mat, with a, the wheel, and she sat in, in our midst. And she was telling us a lot about a lot of things, what a potter does. And she was reminding us we are like a, like a mat in the hand of the potter. And then she told us the first thing that the potter does is they, they center the mud in the wheel. Because if you put it in one side, it will swivel and it can't stay on the wheel. And she says, God, the first thing God wants is to center our life in Jesus. And then he can form us into any shape he wants, any shape he desires, any shape he likes. Brothers and sisters, I think we are in the last days. If you don't agree with that, I can say we are one day closer to the last days when compared to yesterday. So we are in the last days. And in this last days, there will be trials and temptation. And this is what the three things we need to do. We need to go back to the people of God and find our faith, our fellowship in the house of God. Second, we need to look back to the word of God. The writer of Hebrew quotes scripture from the Old Testament, from various places, and says, 
This is why you should believe. Brothers and sisters, we should believe because the word said so. And finally, he calls us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the beginner, the author, and the finisher of our faith. We are here because of him. And then he has prepared a wonderful place for all of us. So we, we are in the last days, and our eyes should be in nothing else but on Jesus. Let's bow our head and pray.